Um, today, uh, Jonathan Scone, who uh, recently joined us from the University of Chicago, is going to talk about um, his experiences there using cloud technologies for research computing. So welcome, Jonathan, and over to you. Thanks, Nick. So are you able to see that just fine? Yep. Well, actually, now it's half. I've now got only half of it on my screen. <laughs> yeah, it's cut off. It's the good half, though. There you go. No, okay. Try again. No. So, are you? Yeah, that's now half. Are you sharing your whole screen, Jonathan? I am not. I'm sharing just the PowerPoint. Let me yeah, just share the whole that. screen. It's easier. Now we're good. Yeah. Okay. So I, uh, as Nick mentioned, I was previously at the University of Chicago, and so um, what I'm going to tell you about is uh, some of the activities that I have participated in there, specifically in the uh, in the cloud space, and um, a little bit about uh, some of the container-related efforts um, at uh, the University of Chicago. So the, the title of the talk is um, you know, Challenges and Successes with uh, a Hybrid Multi-Cloud Implementation. And so this is something that a lot of uh, research computing centers have been pushing forward with thinking about and trying to implement, um, either by pulling in vendors and using ready-made um, offerings or uh, trying to implement something on their own. So this, this activity started um, several years ago um, and uh, uh, we had just recently um, submitted a short paper, a conference paper to the, the PERC uh, conference that was held in July. And that reference is, is here. Okay, so I, before um, kind of getting down to the use of the um, cloud resources at the University of Chicago, I should kind of preface that by giving you um, a picture of the landscape of, of research computing at the uh, at, the, uh, at the University of Chicago. So the traditional HPC is still a dominant um, uh, driving force for scientific applications uh, with uh, the, the environment consisting of uh, more than uh, 1800 compute resources. They're, they're heterogeneous resources. So there's, there are several clusters um, that are supported uh, and those clusters themselves are heterogeneous uh, pools of resources. So as faculty want to, uh, augment their own personal resources they can buy in and, and have dedicated resources. So there is there's no condo model at the University of Chicago where you buy and your resources are available to all the users. Uh, instead, they are dedicated for your use and only your group's use. And so if you don't use it, um, it, it just sits idle. Uh, the, um, uh, but the most, for the most part, the people that do pay for and have dedicated resources have them uh, in use more than 85% of the time. Uh, the, the resources that are consumed are uh, mostly by uh, the folks that are doing things that I, I classify as non-traditional HPC in the sense of if you went to a DOE, resource, a DOE or um, other national facility, uh, you uh, have, uh, or at least uh, the, um, the bigger uh, Oscar facilities like Argonne and Oak Ridge, you have a very high barrier to using those resources and that you have to demonstrate scalability and you have to be able to run on, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of nodes. And so for most, you know, that, that is kind of like the, the um, entry point for, for doing HPC on those resources, which uh, you, we don't typically have in an academic research computing center. There are uh, very highly scalable jobs 
Um, it's just that they don't, uh, that they're less than 20% of the, the total utilization. So that, that, that doesn't mean that they don't consume a, a fair, fair number of, of, um, of uh, uh, service hours. Uh, but if you look at the number of jobs that are submitted to the scheduler, more than 80% of them are, are sort of the single node or high throughput, uh, single task type jobs. Um, we've noticed that, uh, and I'm sure this is the case across most uh, 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 computing centers, that there's a growing non-traditional uh, user base uh, that uh, considers themselves HPC because they themselves um, are coming from uh, an area uh, of you uh, or coming from um, the um, uh, use of just their their laptop or desktop to do most of their their computation in, in science and for them to use uh, a job scheduler and an, uh, an hpc resource uh, constitutes uh, using hpc uh, even if they're just simply using uh, an, you know a, a several cores on a machine or more memory that's accessible on a single node uh, for them, that that is that is considered HPC, and this is a, a lot of this is driven by folks coming into the space that are not in the physical sciences, uh, that are in uh, uh, sci uh, in, in scientific uh, domains that um, um, where where AI and data science is pervasive, which is at all ends of of, of uh, uh, scientific computing, uh, and so there's there's also been a need for um, uh, continued need for container support, uh, especially um, in the last year with uh, uh, a lot of the major vendors releasing their own container libraries. So Intel released theirs at the end of last year and similarly NVIDIA did the same. And um, there's been um, growing adoption, at least while I was still at the University of Chicago, um, more and more people were using NVIDIA's NGC containers just to uh, uh, quickly get up and running um, with whatever uh, with a particular GPU application that they, they have um, uh, for their workflow. Uh, and so then also alongside this traditional HPC workloads is the need for uh, new types of support services to uh, meet uh, and augment the scientific computing e ecosystem. So this is these are things that are not just simply compute driven um, by using say larger memory, more, more cores or scaling out across resources, but there's other things that uh, folks have come to uh, the computing center to rely on uh, or to provide for them to, to be able to uh, do their scientific work. And, and those, those requirements that the researchers have been, um, uh, you know, asking for are things uh, that I, I think at NERSC are, are uh, you know, has, has similarly been, been required um, for, you know, some time now. And that is, you know, support for uh, persisting services such as uh, databases, um, having having the ability to expose their data through scientific gateways uh, is something that is is uh, maybe non-trivial uh, for them, uh, and they are hopeful and that that the computing center can provide this service, uh, especially in some disciplines where there's a requirement for. Um, having a uh, the, the the data that's generated from the grant to be publicly accessible. Um, so you, you can you can skirt around this by using um, uh, data site or, uh, or sorry Zenodo um, or other publicly um, uh, accessible uh, 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 data data stores for any of the artifacts that are generated. But um, they would be convenient if this was also uh, available at their uh, local computing center where the data was generated. Um, so there's also been a need for having on-demand resources in particular for teaching. Um, so folks that are using uh, uh, Jupyter Notebooks to teach um, had been previously relying on Google's collaboratory uh, to provide that, um, but they would like to have uh, access to other types of resources um, and, and things that, you know, things that they, they uh, want to incorporate into their uh, into their uh, course that they can't otherwise get through Google Collaboratory. Um, and um, there, there has been uh, as well a, a push for having more portable cloud native technologies, uh, you know, supporting containers um, and, and making it accessible that uh, folks can, can take anything that has been built in Docker and run uh, on the computing center. Uh, and there's uh, additionally been uh, requests to uh, 
uh, have uh, cloud resources and services accessible. And so that's you know things in the in 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 the scope of uh, I have money and I want to have resources now, or I know about uh, a, a particular as a service uh, a machine learning as a service uh, that is available on amazon and i want to take advantage of it uh, how do i do that so ways that the the university uh, computing center has adapted to uh, support these uh, evolving needs um, there are there are a number of them so one in in terms of providing web portals and data gateways, um, there is a Rancher service. Uh, it's it's a little bit dated. This is this is Rancher One, uh, with uh, which which has um, uh, the orchestration is 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 uh, with with Cattle, not Kubernetes. Uh, that is integrated with GitLab. Uh, so there's self-hosted GitLab that um, uh, that has um, that talks to Rancher uh, through a registry where. Uh, this, the privileged staff and also privileged developers can um, uh, push uh, uh, can, can push images to this registry that that uh, Rancher is then able to um, uh, provision those services. So this provides access to uh, web services and scientific gateways. Um, but it's unfortunately, unlike at NERSC, it's it's something that is uh, only um, uh, accessible to uh, the staff. So the staff have to provide this service, and so it's it's only uh, uh, per, uh, it's only provisioned on a case by case basis, depending on the particular projects and and the and the visibility of it. Uh, will will there be given a um, uh, the staff's time to stand up uh, those services? So there's. Uh, been uh, the support for containers uh, in HPC, uh, and and that's that's been in existence uh, through uh, sometime uh, late 2017, uh, and that's uh, that's been that's been provided through Singularity, um, and there's there's document there, there's minimal amount of documentation for folks to get up and running using Singularity on these resources, and there is a separate um, CI/CD server. Uh, which is uh, meant to provide uh, privileged staff and developers with an environment to create Docker containers. So this is not for the uh, average, this is not for the, the, the regular sets of users of the HPC resource. It's, it's for um, the, the folks with admin privileges uh, to create containers in that environment, um, as well as the developers of a particular project um, to have access to and create containers that can be used uh, on the HPC resource. So for the most part, uh, users themselves have to bring their own containers uh, to, to run on the HPC resource. Um, there's also been the um, enabling or use of public cloud resources, and that's been done through this hybrid uh, uh, cloud solution called Skyway. Uh, it's, a, it's a cloud agnostic gateway infrastructure and uh, software package that uh, provides uh, services that uh, essentially links the on-premise and cloud resources. And uh, another thing that is uh, more recently, uh, this is just sort of as I was exiting uh, the University of Chicago, uh, more folks that are in the, uh, when I say non-traditional non, HPC scientific computing space uh, have been uh, uh, been ported into using the, uh, the HPC resources. And for them, a, there's a large barrier uh, to using the command line. And so for that, um, developing additional uh, custom point and click uh, graphical user interfaces for them in order for, so that they can use the remote desktop uh, client um, and just uh, uh, simply uh, click on, on the, um, uh, the, the utilities to uh, either uh, bring up a, a GUI to, to set the, the particular job um, resource requirements that they need to launch a job or to bring up a particular application like RStudio or Jupyter uh, without having to do anything with the command line. Okay, so examples of um, you know, the scientific gateway support, uh, there's this uh, QRESP, um, project for scientific re reproducibility. And there's the XROM project, uh, which is this X-ray uh, motion uh, data of, of, uh, of animals. Uh, and in the, in the particular case, in both particular cases, the, the researchers, they require exposure of their data through a data portal. Um, 
And in some cases, they need a way to ingest data through a data portal. Um, so we provide uh, both uh, the ability to expose the data externally as well as to ingest data through a web portal. Um, the uh, public facing uh, websites, uh, they're, they're, as I mentioned before, those are for the, those are only in, internally accessible uh, to the staff. So staff have to create uh, this, this uh, site in, in GitLab and push this Docker image to the internal registry uh, in order for them uh, to provision the service to Rancher. Uh, so Globus is used in all cases to mediate data transfer. Uh, there is a FTP server also, uh, sorry, HTTP server also running for, for the QRS project uh, just to make it accessible uh, to quickly be able to grab files uh, without having to set up any kind of transfer, uh, inter, uh, transfer credentials to, to move data by, by, uh, via Globus. So an example, the example here of the XROM data management portal um, this one is is used. Uh, there's this is using the the um, uh, the Globus SDK to create uh, a data portal uh, for ingestion of data with a specific schema. So they they have an instrument with a um, with a, a desktop uh, attached to the instrument, and the, uh, the the data is is migrated off of that instrument uh, by them uh, going into the web browser, bringing up this portal, and uh, on the back in the background, there's a, a Globus um, uh, Personal Connect client running on that desktop, uh, which uh, allows them to to move the data through this web portal uh, and 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 put all of the metadata in uh, or collect all the metadata uh, and put it into a schema so that uh, uh, not only is this ingested, but then they can also go back and and uh, and browse uh, the data in sort of a meaningful way. Uh, another example is the QRS project. Um, which was meant for uh, making uh, data artifacts of of, uh, of any any research scientific research uh, computing project accessible uh, all packaged together with with the connectivity between the um, the binaries the um, uh, workflow scripts and the the uh, resulting uh, uh, well intermediary as well as resulting data products. Um, and in this case, this 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 was meant to be external. Uh, uh, the, uh, the 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 implicate the the need for the science gateway is, was to uh, make the data publicly accessible. Um, and so this the the in in, um, in the case of the Xron project that has been developed internally and put facing through uh, through ranchers. So everything is containerized. Um, this QRS project also has a front end that has been containerized, but this. Um, what you see here, uh, or what is publicly accessible, is running on a service that's outside of the um, uh, the computing center, managed by, by that that group themselves. So the support for containers in the HPC environments, we use Singularity. Uh, it's the most prevalent for research computing, uh, and it's uh, you know it has different uh, approach to security model compared to Docker. Uh, the use of the sing of singularity at the computing center uh, essentially enables folks to use Docker containers. Um, so they they can build with Docker, uh, but they 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 convert and run um, their uh, images as as uh, singularity image files. The the thing though is that uh, users cannot build uh, in in this environment, and that is. It's a, it's a small pain point for some. Uh, for the most part, uh, a majority of the users just simply need to be able to pull an existing Docker uh, uh, image that has been created by a particular software project. Um, so they're not they're not uh, interested in, in building their own containers. They just want to run what exists uh, in, in uh, some registry. Um, so part of the containerization. Uh, uh, at at uh, the University of Chicago, um, led to a project that uh, was aimed at making um, or thinking about scalable uh, uh, scalable uh, HPC software, and in doing so, and we were intending to kind of remove this um, issue that that folks have with uh, you know the inconsistencies between the, the the libraries that the common libraries on the system as well as the the libraries that are in the software stack um, and and just not having to or as, as remove as much as possible or minimize the um, need to communicate with uh, either the the software developers or the folks that maintain the software stack at the HPC centers uh, because that can 
um, you know, in, in my experience, that can be time consuming or, it can, you know, it can instead of spending just a few hours or getting something done in a day, you, you end up spending a week until um, you get the, the right people um, involved. Uh, and that, you know, this this also um, can can lead to a delayed resolution of any kind of software bug. So the, the intent uh, what, at the University of Chicago was to think about um, how to use that CI CD environment uh, where we can build the containers to build something locally at, at the research computing center that could be used at other uh, resources. Uh, so in particular, we, we were interested in using this at ALCF. And this is the, um, this is the particular software uh, that was was containerized and and uh, uh, for the scaling uh, uh, scaling application. And uh, just sort of in a nutshell, what uh, uh, was done uh, in order to um, uh, use this at two different resources. So the the I mentioned before, there's um, uh, an environment for developers and for privileged users or not users, privileged staff at the University of Chicago to build uh, Docker containers. And so this, this stack was built at the University of Chicago. Um, and then uh, the uh, image was pushed to uh, a registry that, uh, that is, is uh, uh, it, sorry, to a Docker registry that uh, hosts the, the MyCon project uh, for this uh, West uh, software. And the, um, uh, the, the folks um, uh, that, that uh, that were at uh, ALCF um, uh, helped with uh, basically identifying which are the particular uh, sets of, of uh, environment variables that need to be in the path in, in order to uh, uh, properly um, use the MPI library at uh, at uh, ALCF. Um, so that, that it, it, in the end, it wasn't uh, so uh, it wasn't so difficult to do this. Wasn't so difficult to do, and and um, it, it just it just was a matter of understanding, you know, what needed to be in the environment, and, and having say documentation to so that the user could uh, straightforwardly do that. Um, the um, the performance from the the scaling tests uh, at the University of Chicago, where we we just uh, evaluated what we were doing with with bare metal versus container in terms of uh, you know having identical uh, environments in the container as well as outside in the bare metal, metal uh, to assess uh, whether or not there's any kind of performance degradation using the, the containerized application. Uh, and we, we didn't see any uh, performance degradation. Um, so scaling up to 256 nodes at the University of Chicago's computing center, uh, there, was, there was no performance penalty for doing that. And then the, so the, the intent here is, um, again, to build something that's portable uh, to other facilities. And in particular, this, this is being run on a leadership computing facility at the ALCF. Um, and uh, the, the, um, the performance there also scales when you go from uh, you know, the small research computing center where you have hundreds of nodes available uh, to thousands of, of nodes. Uh, there's no there's no drop off in performance uh, or penalty in performance for running in the container on on the on the ALCF's uh, 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 facilities. So uh, the this plot here shows both Intel and GCC builds, and effectively the Intel build is 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 uh, more performant than the GCC. It's not uh, has nothing to do uh, with the container itself. Um, and uh, as you push uh, sort of the the the, to the full machine, you can actually see that uh, uh, the performance is still scales out to 4,000 4, nodes in the container. So the, the intent of using these um, uh, containers was, again, for the uh, assessment of portability, uh, because it's something that uh, you know, users at the University of Chicago, which also have access to resources, at uh, DOE facilities uh, such as Argon and, and NERSC, uh, they want to they want to assess you know whether they can have uh, a small smaller environment to develop in and, and be able to run and and be able to push out to larger resources uh, where well, where they have particular workloads that uh, or particular job sizes that that's appropriate. Um, so the um, uh, you know th this can also be you know thought in terms of the the uh, 
you can think about this in terms of fair um, and the reproducibility aspect of, of user containers uh, for, for, for porting across uh, resources. Um, because all these packages that are contained within the, uh, the container are uh, accessible um, or reusable across uh, the various resource centers. So the, the HPC containers, they um, uh, are able to scale on the HPC systems with bare metal performance. And so it is, it is uh, uh, there is no um, performance penalty for running uh, at scale across uh, uh, all the, the resources that are available at the center, uh, even if it inside of a container. The, um, the portability though requires that the uh, glibc and the kernel have compatibility um, between the host and, and the container. And that this, I think a lot of this has been uh, since, um, is, is not really as much of an issue now as it was, um, say this is a year and a half ago, um, that the, um, the there were there are a lot of it there there were some hurdles with using the MPI and GPU drivers and having API compatibility between them. Um, so if you know that as I had indicated in the previous slide, there's there's efforts uh, underway to do this with say starting with uh, the uh, NVIDIA set of blast containers and and uh, instead of having a home homegrown um, uh, set of, of containers and and and. Uh, and, and doing this, reproducing the same um, study across uh, various sites. Um, so uh, the, I guess the biggest takeaway from um, doing this, because I, I don't know that this is, this is novel, the folks at Lionel had also done a scaling test uh, around the same time that, that we had done this, um, but they, they, had, they had published, um, I think in 2018, and, uh, uh, or 2019. That, that this, you know, the scalability is not an issue. You can run uh, at scale in containers. Um, uh, but the, the thing that I think needs to be, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, addressed is that folks still cannot build on most HPC systems. Um, and, uh, you know, in this, this particular study, the, the, um, the, the use of the uh, resource was, was by privileged users um, and not just say a general user that can build in that environment and then take it elsewhere. Uh, so that, that's just something that, um, again, at the University of Chicago, there have been very few users that, that have requested uh, something like this, but there are some. Um, and and uh, we don't, there isn't, uh, or at least there, there wasn't when I was there, a, an environment for, for doing this. Okay, so the the other the other sort of adapting use case uh, at the university is this um, uh, uh, use of, of cloud resources, and so in order to understand um, where to attack, uh, pro, you know, providing some kind of um, extend ex, extendable uh, resource use in the cloud, uh, needed to assess internally what are the um, uh, the user base's interest in using cloud computing. And so we, we spent some time, um, this is uh, several years ago, to evaluate um, the need for cloud resources. Uh, and the, the things that came out of that assessment were that uh, two departments in particular um, uh, had money uh, and regularly wanted to buy on-demand resources. They did not want to pay for uh, dedicated resources because that would be a waste of, of their uh, of their money uh, because they only need maybe um, two months out of a year where they they need to fully use several hundred uh, nodes uh, in order to run a workload um, and so for them having um, you know a having high resource usage but infrequently um, it was was a, a, a need for them to be able to pay on on demand for for these resources. Uh, there are also faculty that don't want to manage user accounts um, or any of the resources, provisioning the resources. That's just a headache in general for folks to, to manage um, any of the, the, the cloud resources themselves. Uh, so they have credits. So a lot of the faculty come into the university with their own um, startup credits from AWS or GCP. Um, and some of them have billing accounts already or they want to have a billing account. Um, but again, they don't want to manage the users uh, or have to deal with, um, aside from just understanding where 
uh, what, what's been spent and, and sort of projecting what, what will be spent. They, they don't want to handle any of the other logistics of that. Uh, so users, uh, so there's also this um, need in, uh, at the university to have new technologies that aren't available on-prem. And again, coming back to community of users that don't have um, uh, the budget to buy dedicated resources. So they don't have, you know, $10,000, $20,000 to, to buy um, a, a node uh, to, to run, run um, uh, their, their workloads against. Uh, instead, they want to have access to some kind of um, uh, new technology that's not in the data center um, and, and only for, you know, a short period of time. Uh, so that, that this sort of is a, another um, particular interest that, that could be um, provided by the cloud. Uh, users also wanted um, privilege, privileges or have the ability to have privilege to install software in uh, an environment. And that's, that's one case for which they come uh, to us and ask for use of cloud resources. Uh, and the other is um, they want to manage their own uh, persisting services. So they want to stand up and uh, their own web application or they want to stand up their own database and they want to be the, the sort of um, the manager of that resource. Uh, and so the latter two are things that we decided um, we, we kind of support, uh, uh, we, we offer support through the through Rancher um, and, and particular use cases that uh, if, they, if there's a, a project um, that is, is deemed fit, we, we, can, we can provide, you know, um, uh, persisting services or, or uh, web portals or web applications uh, for the user. Um, the, but the, um, and the uh, use of the uh, privileged environment is something that we, we just simply don't support directly. Folks can build their own containers and bring those uh, if that's a requirement to build a particular software stack. So it's not that, uh, you know, we, we aren't uh, making, um, uh, there, there isn't an ability to do that. Uh, so users do have the, um, uh, have the ability to build their own containers where they can have control of the, the environment itself. Um, so the, the first three uh, items are what we focused our efforts in thinking about how to build out a, um, a hybrid, a hybrid uh, cloud computing technology. Okay, so Skyway is the, the hybrid solution that is meant to build uh, and, and bridge between on-prem uh, HPC cluster and, and cloud services. Uh, so it simplifies the usage of the cloud computing for the existing computing center users. So that was, you know, so requirement one was, uh, I don't want to manage like, as a PI, I don't want to manage users. Um, can you please uh, set up something that is uh, automatically does this for me? Um, the, uh, the Skyway also provides a custom set of services and tools uh, as, a, as a Python package. Um, and these, these tools and services that act uh, to bridge between the on-prem and the clouds, uh, cloud, cloud environment, they, they facilitate the management and the, and the monitoring payment of the, the cloud resources. So you can think of Skyway as, as two things. Um, one is this, that it's, uh, it's a custom Python package that you know, is the glue between the services that are running on, uh, on this kind of gateway resource. Um, to connect on-prem and cloud. And it, it's also, uh, it's an infrastructure, right? So it's, it's this infrastructure gateway that, that bridges between the on-premise HPC, HPC and, and the cloud. Um, and so Skyway itself is actually set up as, as, a, as a, a collection of VMs. Um, and the, the VMs themselves, they mirror the on-premise operating system, the, the module environments, and the user accounts. And so we, we import those from, from, uh, from the university's LDAP, just the same as we do on the HPC cluster. So the, uh, the intent then for this uh, hybrid cloud solution was for the users that needed this on-demand or specialized resources and um, you know, they're, they're already comfortable with using command line environments. So it's not, it was not intended or architected with the, the idea of building something that is point and click uh, for them to use cloud resources. Uh, so it is not in the, it is not uh, something like Ronin uh, or, um, or uh, uh, the, the, the folks that, um, that, that provide um, the HPC finite element codes um, 
with this point and click uh, container technology to use use cloud resources. Um, the uh, sorry, I'm, I'm thinking of rescale. Yeah, so it's not it's not like rescale, and it's not like Ronin. So there's not this uh, you know single single inter, uh, user uh, interface um, uh, pane where folks can manage their resources or interact by point and click. It is meant to be command line driven. Um, the platform is uh, you know can flexibly interface with most of the cloud providers. Um, so it is it was set up with GCP and AWS initially, and Oracle then. Uh, joined the party uh, about a year ago, um, but it's never or the the Oracle um, partition has never never actually uh, been put into production. So it's uh, meant to also make it easy for the users to uh, uh, to be added through the PI's cloud account with no management of users' accounts uh, required from the PI. So there's no privilege needed to be imparted from the PI themselves. Uh, and the features like the billing, um, uh, uh, there's a billing module that prevents spending of a, a particular PI or a project beyond a preset budget. So I have a picture here, Yushin Pang, who was the principal architect uh, behind uh, the initial push for, for Skyway. Uh, so the use cases uh, of Skyway were for on-demand computing, uh, for the use of on-demand uh, on specialized hardware, and, uh, and for the case of uh, you know, wanting to use cloud, um, but not manage users, it's the things that were outlined, outlined before. So the infrastructure layout um, uh, looks, uh, looks like this. And um, again, Skyway is, is sort of, can be thought of as, as two things, right? It's, it's uh, it's an infrastructure as well as a software, a custom software package. And so it's, it's uh, the, the infrastructure part um, is, is a gateway. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's this, um, in this diagram there, there everything that is in pink is, this, uh, is, is within the scope of the uh, HPC Computing Center uh, at the University of Chicago. And so Skyway is, is uh, at, at least initially it is set up as two VMs. One is a login VM and the other is a, is a management or service VM. And the, um, the, the, uh, the, 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 the idea is that this is outside of the um, HP, well, it's, it's still in, within the scope of the uh, HPC uh, uh, resource center environment, but it's, it's a separate resource. Uh, which doesn't doesn't bring in um, the complexities of of trying to uh, you know do this on the on uh, on the fly with a production system. So we have a, sort of a, a way of, of of keeping things safe from uh, the, the the production environment uh, while building out the infrastructure for interfacing with the the cloud environment. Um, so the the cloud scratch and on premise are uh, you know made accessible uh, on this uh, on these research on these Skyway resources so that uh, the users themselves can uh, migrate data between the on prem and the, and the cloud resource um, and uh, the, the users they can access this node either uh, uh, publicly they can go to the the login nodes of the HPC cluster and then connect to the Skyway. Um, uh, the Skyway resource uh, login, or they can, if they're on the campus network, uh, this uh, this login notice is accessible um, uh, on that network. So the the uh, cloud VMs, um, they or the cloud resources that are that uh, are part of this um, infrastructure, uh, they have a custom image that matches the Skyway uh, uh, gateway node operating system. And configuration and this same custom image is used for all of the um, cloud VMs um, as well as the uh, as well as the IO node that is is, uh, uh, is is in the cloud. So for each uh, cloud resource provider, uh, this IO node is set up, and the purpose of that IO node is to act as NFS export service. Uh, so the the cloud scratch each one of the cloud service providers. Uh, is set up with a uh, persisting uh, uh, scratch uh, storage that is then exported to uh, the uh, Skyway login, so that uh, uh, the the users that are that are um, here on the, on the login can see uh, that 
um, that's uh, that scratch base, and it was also then to export that scratch base to all the instantiated VMs uh, as they are uh, uh, as they are created on demand. Uh, so the I/O node and the scratch storage is the only thing that persists uh, in this setup. So the VMs themselves are um, uh, spun up and torn down on a uh, on, on demand base. This, the I/O nodes persist as well as the scratch base, and the scratch base is. is Initially, it's not it's not very large. It's just enough for the workloads that we're running here to to have enough space to run. So we're talking just a, a handful of terabytes, um, not 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 much more than that. So the login node uh, that is uh, um, th this login node VM is configured to resemble the uh, the environment of of the HVC resource login node. Um, so again, it has the same operating system and, and uh, environment that you would find here on the login node, um, with uh, the exception that the, um, the user's home is not the same as on the, the main HPC space. Uh, and that's because the, the home here uh, on this, this uh, login node is not exported to uh, the, each of the, the cloud uh, instances. So, the users have to actually work out of a, a different space, which is mounted at cloud. Um, and this this uh, uh, this space is is accessible. Uh, it, it's the it's the scratch space that the cloud provider um, that's mounted on the login node. It's, they have to work out of that space. So this kind of uh, this can be a hang up uh, for some folks because. Uh, People that are using Conda environments have a habit of, of you know, managing those in their home directory. And so they have to you know, point to a different path in order to install and manage their environments. Um, it's, it's, again, it, for, for folks that are uh, regularly, regularly using and, and can manage the, their Conda environments, it's, it's, not, it's not a deal breaker. Um, uh, some, some folks that, uh, that are not regularly managing kind of environments, um, uh, that, that, that could be something that is a, too much of a barrier for them. Um, and the software stack is, is not the same. Um, it, you, the, the software stack is built for each one of these cloud environments in, on, on a, um, in, this, in, in a, a separate uh, space that is, uh, exists in the, in, the, uh, in the cloud. And so that in order to build software, you have to log in here, or you have to be able to manage to access this resource and um, get on a VM and build from there. Because the the software um, the, the software stack is is local to the cloud and it's not local to the HPC resource. Um, so that 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 poses uh, some challenges uh, if if you want to manage uh, or you have if you have a lot of software that needs to be. Um, uh, needs to be stood up. Uh, there are a bunch of commonly used packages that have already been pre-installed for the cloud environments. But when I say that it's meant to mirror the HPC resource, it's it's meant to have those versions of software available in the cloud um, that the folks commonly use, uh, like Python, R, um, uh, things like Romex, uh, and other MD software uh, are, are all accessible. So that 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 when I say mirrored environment here for the login node, the, the Linux the Linux users and groups are uh, again uh, pulled from the LDAP, so it is using the same credentials to authenticate uh, users. And the um, the Slurm is the same sets of commands that they're familiar with. It's the same type of job scheduler, but this is a separate instance of Slurm. Um, the modules and software are not. Uh, the same, but again, we're using LMOD, uh, just the same as in the login, so it has the same feel, and they can find some of the common modules that they uh, were using at, on, on the HPC resource there. And the project storage, where it's just kind of like the community file system at NERSC, is accessible on this, this resource. So the, the management uh, or service node uh, it's it's again uh, configured to resemble the environment of the main HPC cluster. Uh, oops, uh, sorry. The, the running services that are on this this particular node uh, are the um, account manager, the cloud manager, the billing manager, the Slurm controller, and an NFS server. So that this management node uh, is uh, is is running this service stack, um, and it's it's responsible for kind of um, 
configuring all of these resources and managing the, the billing and, and uh, interfacing with the Slurm client that is on the login node. Okay, so that management uh, node has this uh, system level Python software package running on it. Um, and this service is to interface the, this, this Slurm scheduler that is on Skyway, which again, this is a separate Slurm uh, controller than is on the HPC resource. Uh, and the, this, this, um, uh, uh, this Python uh, software package uh, interfaces the Slurm scheduler with the various cloud SDKs. Um, so the Skyway Managed Service node runs uh, these services uh, as a daemon as daemon processes, uh, and and in, in, for example, in the case of the um, uh, the uh, billing manager, it writes a, a flat file that is is periodically read to, to understand like what is the current state of the um, uh, usage of of a particular project. Uh, so requirements for running this software stack are that the the uh, the node itself has NF NFS uh, server uh, uh, running, and it has uh, Slurm installed and configured. Uh, the uh, Python 3 requirements are uh, related to implementing this um, uh, cloud interface, and that is BOTO3 for, uh, for AWS, LibCloud for the other, uh, other cloud providers, and PySQL for managing um, the accounting database uh, of the, uh, sorry, the billing database. So the account manager is responsible for associating the cloud billing accounts to specific group, group attributes uh, uh, that are uh, part of the on-prem environment. Uh, and that's synced with the cloud partition resources that are visible to the Skyway users. Um, the billing manager is, is a daemon process that uh, effectively monitors the real-time budget and the cost status for each billing account. And the cloud manager is sort of the brain of, of the uh, of the um, uh, of the management node, it's it's a daemon process that's continually checking the status of the Slurm queue and the cloud account usage information, uh, and so it integrates with the uh, the cloud SDKs, uh, and it it's its job is to operate on the cloud nodes by either creating or um, removing or annihilating those resources, and it does this um, uh, by querying the billing module to report the budget status. Uh, and making you know actionable items based on the information that is is supplied from there. So the the Slurm controller uh, that is uh, on this Skyway management resource uh, is the way that the users themselves are interacting with. It's it's kind of that that's the gateway from the Slurm client uh, where the the folks uh, the users have access to on the Skyway login node. Um, and so the user can submit jobs um, and uh, the Slurm controller has a, a hook to a low out plugin script. Uh, and that's, that's what interfaces with the billing manager. So from the, from the client, they can issue commands to interact with the Slurm controller. And if they submit a, a particular job, that jobs, uh, the, the, the low out script that is um, uh, running on this resource will then first, uh, you know, uh, check with the billing manager to understand whether or not uh, something can be scheduled. If the nodes themselves aren't provisioned, you know, they're, they're, not, they're, they're not in existence on the cloud resource, uh, they, they, they'll appear as uh, in a drained state to the user um, until they've been provisioned. So the users themselves can query the, the database, uh, the SlurmDB, because there's SlurmDB also running on this management resource um, at, at any time to query past that statistics. Okay, so the, the Slurm controller, uh, as I mentioned, it's it's a separate, um, at least initially it was set up as an, a separate uh, controller from, uh, from the main HPC resource. Um, the instances that are defined in the uh, configuration for Slurm uh, are, are not configurable by the user. So this requires an administrator to uh, input the sets or types of nodes that they would like to have in a configuration file. Um, so before a project begins, a PI has to indicate, or the users uh, uh, of a particular project have to indicate what instances they want. So it's not that they can just choose uh, on the fly particular types of instances that they want to see. They have to 
uh, beforehand, uh, you know, sort of a priori say like, these are the things that uh, I would like to have uh, available in, in this uh, particular project. Um, so then once that's uh, been done, uh, then the nodes themselves can be elastically provisioned. Uh, and and if, if that's if the, uh, the, the controller itself, if this is accepted by the controller uh, for it, whatever, whatever cloud resource uh, and billing account that's associated to the user. Uh, the controller uh, runs on this Skyway management server. And so here, uh, if you're on the login, you can type sinfo and get information about the resources that are available. Um, and you can, for example, interactively connect to the resources. Uh, and you see that here they're, they're in a drain state and that's because they're um, they've been in the configuration file, they're set as the types of nodes that are available um, as a resource. Uh, usually the project, the, the way this is specified is as project name followed by the service provider here, it's Google, uh, along with uh, the particular type of resource. Um, and uh, once, uh, once the user has submitted uh, a particular job and it's identified that they have sufficient budget, uh, and the type of resource that they've requested is, is one that is available to them, then the job uh, will be provisioned and this will go from drain to, to running. So the, this Luau plugin script um, that interfaces with the, um, uh, the, the uh, that interfaces with the, the rest of the uh, Skyway um, uh, uh, daemon processes. So this, the job submissions are sent to the scheduler uh, they're, they're checked by this Luau submission script. And then, you know, it, depending on the billing uh, module, whether or not it's identified if there's resources, uh, sufficient billing, uh, sorry, sufficient uh, budget left, um, and the resources are either in existence or, or not available, it will spin them up uh, and, start the, and start the job. Uh, so here, for example, uh, a job is accepted um, where, uh, uh, the, um, the, it understands that there is budget available and they're, they're under, under, they're within their balance um, and uh, the job, job will start. Whereas if the, um, uh, the job itself is first checked by this uh, little plugin, plugin script to, with the, the billing manager, uh, it, it understands that there, there is not uh, enough uh, budget. And so it, the job itself will, will be rejected. So the, the, um, it's possible that it can also evaluate future usage from running jobs. That, that depends on if you specify uh, the amount of time that you're going to use. Otherwise it will default to whatever the default time limit is, which is, which is infinite. So it's, it's a good idea to uh, specify a time limit. So the cloud manager daemon uh, is it runs uh, on the Skyway management, and it's 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 in the, it's a background process. It's continually checking whether or not to create or release cloud nodes. Um, so this this is using the Apache's libcloud Python library to manage creation and annihilation of uh, resources other than than uh, AWS. So AWS was provisioned with with the uh, the both of three. Um, it, um, it queries the, the billing module to report budget status and uses this report to decide uh, the types of actions that it should take on the jobs and the resources. Uh, so some resources are, are protected. As I mentioned, the IO nodes and the storage, uh, those are not, um, uh, cannot be um, destroyed. Uh, they must persist. And so here is an example of the, uh, uh, of the um, configuration file. Um, which specifies the type of node instances that are available uh, for uh, a particular uh, a particular a, a, a project account. Okay, so then this billing manager here uh, can collect the information uh, and and generate the billing report. Uh, the billing module is, is is again it's another daemon process. It's running on the Skyway management server. It watches over the real time budget and the cost status. Um, and provides uh, reporting of, of uh, usage for the, the, the end user as well as the PI. Um, so it looks like I'm running out of time here. So I want to quickly, the flowchart of actions that the jobs and the resources go through here uh, is uh, that, that the, the, the brains of this um, uh, the cloud daemon are to assess if the budget exceeded. And if it is, then it's going to send uh, send a, a message to kill uh, all jobs and release the nodes. 
Uh, if there's an if it's not exceeded, then it checks for a new if a new node is needed. If if it, the answer is yes, then it checks to see if the cost rate will be exceeded. And if the answer is no, then it creates a new node and, and does other operations in terms of uh, getting getting the um, uh, getting the job launched. Um, so here uh, the is a, an example of uh, the Skyway budget system notification. Um, the, the, billing the billing module itself monitors uh, all of the real-time uh, budget balance and makes these notifications uh, to the user. So what about bursting the resources? Uh, cloud bursting generally means switching workloads to public cloud resources when local resources are not available. Um, so what I've described thus far uh, does not account for um, you know, this idea of like bursting, bursting to cloud. Uh, where things just automatically happen when resources aren't available. You have to consciously make a decision that you want to use cloud resources and you have to set up and, and run things. Um, and so the, the standard workflow uh, requires the user to do uh, the following things. They have to log into the Skyway resource from the on-premise cluster. Uh, they have to copy their data uh, and you know on the premise, uh, from the on-premise mounted storage, this project space to the cloud mounted scratch space. And then they have to submit the job to the scheduler. And at the completion of the job, then they have to copy back their outputs uh, back to the on-prem storage. Uh, this workflow is you know, rather inconvenient for the users and it's, it's, it's sort of a, a barrier to adoption of the service. Uh, so to address this, um, uh, I had created this um, uh, uh, workflow module uh, which uh, acts like a, any other uh, LNOD module that you can load and then uh, allows for the use of, of a, a prefix command Skyway to then interact with the remote resource. Um, so the workflow package um, uh, essentially allows the users to interact with this cloud resource um, uh, such that they don't have to log into that resource. Uh, so it, it relies essentially on having an SSH uh, key um, uh, that is uh, set up on the Skyway login so that it can send uh, remote commands uh, to Skyway to um, either submit query jobs and to move data between um, the uh, on-prem HPC resource and the cloud environment. Okay, um, so the Current usage statistics of this, this um, resource, there are uh, about 90 total users that have used it to date. There are eight different projects served. Uh, there've been about 2000 jobs submitted and about $18,000 of cloud credits has been consumed between AWS and GCP. Uh, and the primary users for this um, resource have been folks in education courses. So you know, things with Jupyter Notebooks and machine learning projects. Um, so things that are pain points for this hybrid implementation um, are the managing of multiple software stacks I mentioned. So each cloud provider instance right now has its own um, uh, globally accessible software stack for the user. Uh, that could be you know, rather cumbersome if you start to add in more software uh, moving forward uh, for the users. The data migration is, is one of the bigger pain points. Um, as I mentioned, everything is NFS mounted um, and uh, the the, uh, the 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 movement of data between uh, the on-prem and, and the cloud could be done in a more efficient uh, manner to uh, make it so that there's less barrier for the users to adopt. Uh, and having the or you know exploring or using federated clusters. So right now, Skyway is a separate instant interface uh, for users to you know uh, manage migration between on-prem and, and cloud resources. And uh, it might serve better if you just simply federate um, the Skyway Slurm cluster with the on-prem cluster uh, and, and build out the infrastructure or the, the sets of tools to, to, manage, uh, to further manage that uh, beyond what, what I had shown in this workflow tool. Um, that, that's more effort for the um, administrators, uh, which would lower the barrier for the users. Uh, so successful applications uh, to date for Skyway um, the on-demand computing of resources, uh, so that that's uh, straightforward. Folks simply need to have uh, you know more uh, more uh, uh, resources available in a short period of time, and they need them on demand. Uh, special hardware configurations. Uh, early on, folks needed um, TPUs. We didn't have TPUs. That's one example of of using the the cloud for that purpose. Uh, small project budgets, again, there are faculty that don't have um, enough money to buy dedicated resources, uh, and so they want to just simply have something they can use once in a while. 
uh, and there's, you know, sort of, it's meant to have zero learning curve, but there, there's, you know, there are some uh, things that could be improved to make it um, better um, for the users. Uh, and so with that, I, oops, I, I thank, thank everybody for your time. I'm over. <laughs>